Welcome to How to Become Zuck, Book One, A Day in the Life of a Software Engineer. You know, coding can be soothing, coding can be, you know, entirely relaxing, coding is, is exhilarating at the same time. You, you know, when you manage to solve a problem that you hadn't solved in a long time, or you, you hit that moment where the, the product comes out and you're like, this, this is what I've been working on, and this is what I've built, um, it's, it's a great feeling, and, uh, you, you know, it has no comparison to me. This decision is yours alone to make. Only do so quickly. I need to tell you about my friend. My friend dreamed about being a video game tester for years. I mean, he just wasn't a great gamer. He saw gaming as a whole new artistic medium. Gaming was in his bones, and he just knew that a career in gaming was his calling. But he faced rejection for two years from every studio he applied to. Finally, after more rejections than he cared to admit, his dogged persistence paid off, and he was hired as a video game tester full time. And then after three months he quit. Why? Because my friend was delusional. He was more into the idea of being a game tester rather than the reality of it. You see my friends, if you're doing your job correctly as a game tester, you are not poning noobs in Call of Duty or spending 40 hours a week getting paid to level up your new paladin. No. Video game testing sucks the fun out of gaming. It's tedious, repetitive, and boring. Not that there's not many great things about being a video game tester. It's an important role, and many people use it as a stepping stone into the gaming design industry. But my friend was clueless to all that, and set himself up for some major disappointment. So here at How to Become Zuck, we are going to inform you about the good, the bad, and the myths of a career in code in general. We do all of that by speaking to developers from Google, Facebook, Tumblr, small startups, independent app developers, all to give you this. Communications, documentation, debugging, testing, agile activities, and even code reviews. Is a career in code really for you? At what point did all these successful engineers did the penny drop for them and they decide, yes, this is my calling? What qualities are consistent among the best developers? Do you have those qualities? And if not, can you acquire them? What do developers actually make these days? All right, so pull up a seat, let's get started and find out if this is for you. First up, we speak to developers and ask them how they knew that this was their calling and what do they actually love about programming? So when I was, uh, I want to say seven or eight, um, she, over the course of two or three days, did some basic Pascal tutorials with me. And from that moment on, I knew I was hooked. I had the most fun ever. I could just spend like eight hours a day, um, you know, making tweaks to my site or searching, um, looking up a best practice and then implementing it or finding like cool new things to do. And it looked great and it didn't look like it was done by a beginner at all. It looked, it looked really good and I was really proud of it. Um, and and once I started that, I just thought, I want to learn everything I can about this. There was something about, you know, making changes to something and seeing seeing it in real life, seeing something you did on the back end, you know, in, you know changing a change to HTML or CSS or something, and then come through the front end and, and look different. That was just really satisfying. And I guess also sort of contributing to the web, like putting something out there about yourself that anyone in the world can access. Like, there's something really fun about that, too. Um, so I just, start, I just started looking for more opportunities to learn. So one of the other things I find really great about, about being a software developer is, is I have people who come to me all the time with these like great ideas or, or more, you know, in conversation, it comes up that like, oh yeah, I've got this really like cool idea that I, you know, I'd love to pursue. And you say, okay, so hey, what's the idea? And, and invariably like 90% of them are, are software development projects or app development projects. And I say that, and they, and I sort of, my suggestion to them is, well, hey, if you want to develop that idea, first step is probably spend a couple of years learning uh, software development. Um, but being someone who's already a software development, when I have those sort of ideas pop into my head, I don't have to spend 10 grand to like create a prototype, you know, outsourcing the creation of a prototype. I can stay up late, like all night for sort of five nights in a row and, and bang, I've got my prototype ready to try out and see if that, that, that idea really is a good idea. So for people with who are those type of people who have these random, cool, creative, crazy ideas popping into their heads all the time, then you'll love being a software developer. 
the thing that I, that, I, that I regret most about life is not knowing what it is that I wanted to do and not knowing what it is that I love to do until so late in life and it was almost accidental. I really wish when I was a kid I, I had been encouraged to, to pursue my interests and my dreams and whatnot. When I was a kid I was terrible in school. I, 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 you know, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do and whatever. I was, just, I was just a kid having fun. I spent way too much time watching TV, way too much time playing video games and yes I do regret that. I, I do think that school it should be about trying to figure out what it is that you love to do. It is, it's not just about what you like to do, but it's about l loving what you do. If you do not love what you do, you're, you're not there yet. What do you want to be when you grow up? So what if you were one of those people whose first introduction to programming was boring? No, I mean like <laughs> kind of boring. Well, meet Michael Wormsley. Michael is a PhD student of computer science and as you will see, a very talented engineer. Michael wanted to teach his younger brother programming. He suspected his little bro might have the gift of code. The problem was that his little brother looked at programming as about as exciting as teaching his grandmother how to change her Facebook privacy settings. Uh, pardon me. I did it before by accident. So, this is how Michael came up with a way to make you and me have fun finding our inner programmer. And so I pointed him in the direction of a few resources that I'd used a couple of years ago to help myself learn JavaScript. Um, so W3 Schools, something that a lot of a lot of people out there have probably heard of. Uh, I pointed him in the direction, I sat him down for 20 minutes, got him to, to have a go, and then a couple of weeks later, I, and he said, okay, yep, yep, I'll, I'll, I'll go and do all those lessons on my own. I, I went back uh, two weeks later, so how's it going? You've done all the, all the JavaScript lessons on W3 Schools? Oh, oh, I did about half an hour. Oh, I've been too busy with my, with my homework, he says as he's in the middle of playing a computer game. A couple of weeks later, I found this, this game called Lightbot. I don't know if you've... Many people out there have played it, but it's had sort of thousands of, of, of plays on the internet. Uh, and it's a, it's a fun little game that teaches basic computer programming concepts. So I show that to my brother, and, and within about you know two hours, he's played all the levels. And, and then when I found Lightbot 2, you know, I, I, I let him know about that. And the following day, I go back, and he says, oh, yeah, I've completed all the levels. And, and I was like, okay, so he's, he's got time for something like Lightbot, which, which teaches a bit of computer programming, but is, is fun. But he doesn't have time for, for W3 schools, which I, I found quite good. Um, but it's not so fun and engaging. Another other resource, and, and this is the last one, something called Hack This Site I, I came across. Um, sort of provides JavaScript-y, web development type coding challenges that sort of teach you hacking with, with the theme of, of hacking, um, hacking computers. And so my brother jumped on and, and got really into that. Uh, they were quite, they required quite advanced web development skills, so he wasn't really able to, to do a lot of the stuff, but he really enjoyed it and, you know, spent hours on it, even though it was far, far above his level. Uh, and so... So I, I sat there and, you know, sort of thinking and said, well, hey, if we can, if I can create something which has the, you know, the game element of Lightbot, the, the ease and, and simplicity and simple, I guess, vocabulary that, um, that and simple instructions that W3 Schools provides in combination with the challenge, exciting challenge aspect and, and theme of, of something like Hack This Site and put that all into one, well, maybe I can actually create something that my brother will, you know, both teach my brother JavaScript, but it's also something he'll sit there and, and do instead of playing computer games when he's got, you know, time to take a break from his homework. A lot of universities um, and high schools teach some of these subjects. It's not that fun. But when you actually get into creating your own projects, you know, and creating stuff that you're, you're into, it, it's really, really fun. Um, but you have to do all that boring learning the basics stuff first. And it's like, well, why does learning the basics have to be any more boring than creating these really cool systems? Mm -hmm. Is. So I want to make that learning process just as fun as it is when you really get into the, the cool stuff and doing your own projects. What are the qualities of the best developers of our day? I put that question to many developers and received many different answers. Not everyone agreed. You want to be a specialist in one area. No, 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 no. You want to be like a jack of all trades. 
barista. Dude, you need to know Java, because it's like so hot right now. Learn Objective C, because iOS is where the money is. We needed to dig deeper. I needed to start to listen to what the developers were actually saying, because if you listen carefully, you can start to see patterns. In fact, we could summarize that among the most respected, highest earning developers out there, there were two qualities that were common in every case. Lisa, what is the difference between them and, and the rest of the pack? You know, it's actually their ability to learn quickly, grasp the concepts. So what was taught in college, to be able to discern the fundamentals and apply them. So there, there's two different types of programmers I've seen out there in the planet. There's ones that are completely academic and can't actually apply the principles. I mean, I can read, touch, hear, but I can't know how to really apply it and make it work for me. So the computer, the whole, you're, what you're doing programming is you're giving instructions. But instructions don't mean anything if you can't apply apply them, right? So the guy that really is a rock star candidate can read the instruction, understand the requirements, and output something that actually adds value to the company. Do you think there's any one set of training or experience or language that you, you know or don't know that, that I can say is, you know, you need this for Google? Google's really about what, what you can do for it in terms of or, uh, your thinking, in, in your line of thinking. And if you can prove that, that, that you're smart, that you can solve problems, then we know you can learn about agile technologies. We know you can learn a new language. We know you can learn a new platform like Android, perhaps. Um, the, the, the sky's the limit as long as you can prove that you can learn. Yeah, okay. I think one of the biggest trends is away from the idea of hiring specialists who are really good at a particular technology and moving more towards hiring people who are really good at problem solving and learning new technologies. So if you're, if you're a junior, actually, rather than trying to say, I'm an expert at this one thing, or I, you know, I've done these five different little projects all in C++, for example, you'd be much better off saying, hey, I've done five different projects in five different languages because it demonstrates that you're willing to learn new things. So I think that's a really big trend, and that is driven in part by the widespread adoption of agile methods, because continuous improvement and learning and cross-training are really big parts of those methods. You know, it's, it's domain knowledge versus process knowledge, right? You can either memorize everything in the world, or you can figure out how to figure out how things work. And if you can have a process style view of a problem, um, then that can really help you learn something, right? Like usually the, the, the smart people, the smart problem solvers I know, know how to look at a problem and break it down and say, okay, right, this is supposed to do this, but it does that. What happens if I do this? Okay, you know, sort of like the science, it's just like the scientific method, you know, and they start ruling out things. Um, and the, as they're doing their research, as they rule out stuff, you know, they take copious notes, they, you know, they look at the problem so that when uh, another experienced person is there, um, you can say, okay, you know, this foo is supposed to do bar, but it's not. I I've ruled out these four things. I'm missing something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, when I watch programmers work, that's how they work. They just kind of um, learn to ask each to learn off of each other, I guess, is, is, is what I'm trying to say. So even really smart students, they might take their first class in programming and be able to solve everything pretty much in their head. They get the idea of how they're going to solve it, and they figure it out before they write it down, before they um, divide the problem up into smaller problems. But then when they hit problems that are bigger and more complex, that they can't solve it completely in their head, and just sit down and write the solution. That's the second kind of dip that you have or learning challenge that a lot of students have is how do I take a complex problem and break it up into smaller problems and see how the smaller problems or solutions work together to make the big solution. That I think is the second big challenge that, that students uh, that students hit. And that's where there are techniques for helping you do that. You just have to listen to them. I think that a lot of times we're lazy 
and we just want to take the quick route. And we think the quick route is just bang out the solution, you know, just um, hammer it out. But that doesn't always work. We need to divide the problem up carefully and think about it before we start writing the solution. Now, it should be said when we talk about communication skills as a developer that there are many developers out there who sort of fall into the old stereotype where they're in their basement on their underwear coding all day and they have no wish to see another living person. There is some truth to it. So, there are developers like Kevin Key, for example, you can watch his interview uh, we did of him called Career Pass of a Software Developer on YouTube. It's free. And he confessed that, hey, you know, he loves technical problems. He has no interest in going up the team lead project manager uh, route. And he's happy with that, and many developers are. But if you do want to grow beyond the technical route, you need communication skills. I get some help to talk about both those things. I cannot stress how valuable your communication skills are. And, and I'll tell you, just real quickly, um, when I went to work in the real world and I was working at Sprint, I started out as a programmer and there were a number of us that were programmers there. And I was a pretty good programmer. I wasn't the best, but I was okay. And I enjoyed it. But I got invited to do some presentations and I did a lot of writing about my, my work and writing documents, requirements documents and design documents. And that's what distinguished me. I got a promotion every year in the five years that I was there because I was not just a programmer, but I was able to communicate well and I was able to interact with others at various levels, whether it was our users or executives in the company or managers. And that is the difference for me on getting those promotions. I had a number of peers who didn't get any of those promotions, even though they were maybe better programmers than me. They weren't as good of communicators. So there's a lot of developers who don't have good communication skills. They program in the day and they play computer games at night and barely talk to another uh, living human being face to face. Um, and so I think if you've got great communication skills, I think that's a big one. So, day in the life of a software developer. What do engineers do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, although it does differ from job to job, we found out that there's a lot less coding than you might think. Out in the real world, you will actually spend a minority of your time programming. Most programmers don't program that much. I think the most I've heard is, I've heard some developers say that they spend 25% of the time programming and 75% of the time doing other stuff. Yeah. One more thing that you would do is you're going to be writing some documentation. So you don't just write software, but you have to write about your software. Whether that's as simple as an email, you're sending an email to somebody saying, hey, this is what I did, or whether it's API documentation and, and technically writing out, this is what the parameters are to this method, and this is what it should, expects to receive, and this is what it should return. Or whether it's a higher level document saying this is what our design is, an architecture document or a testing document. So actual writing is important. That's great. One other area would be like a customer meeting. So if you're meeting with a customer to figure out what do they want the software to do and just making sure that you understand what they're doing. That's one of the qualities of a good software developer is the ability to see things from someone else's perspective. You'll probably write software for people who are doing things that you've never done, whether it be a nurse or a real estate agent or whatever. And you've got to be able to put yourself in their shoes and see things from their perspective and learn their domain. We were building software for a oil company. I never worked in the oil industry and I had to learn all of their terminology and their language in order to build software for them. That's very common. How much time on average do you spend documenting? Um, documenting it, I'd say probably about 5 to 20% of my time. Pair programming is becoming, I, I don't know if I'd say challenging, but it's definitely changing in, uh, in what it feels like to pair program compared to week one. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, pair program. We talked about that uh, in in the free show a little bit. So it sounds awesome to to work with someone, especially someone like me. If I were to start something like that, to just work with with someone else and kind of share the burden of of of, of coding through this. But the, the, do you actually code the very same piece of code at the same time? How does that work? Do <laughs> That's not, a great question. How do you not step over each other? So the physical construct that we're using is we have one computer with two keyboards and two mice and two monitors. Wow. Uh, so if both people typed at the same time, it would actually type in the same place from two keyboards. It would not work. <laughs> wow. Okay. okay. Um, so there's a very high level of communication that's required. Um, and there are, some, there are some challenges and there are some benefits inherent in this. So some of the benefits are... Um, that if you don't understand some, something, you have someone you can talk to. Different people can understand different aspects of a, uh, of a program. You know, one person can really be awesome at math, and maybe they supply the math component. And another person has a very clear idea of how to visualize and style things in, in a graphical way. Um, and that's a great aspect of teamwork. You also have someone to check your code, make sure you're not making careless mistakes, because that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and from a student perspective, it's very educational. So here's how we often structure it. We have a term called driver and navigator. The driver is the person holding the keyboard and the mouse. The navigator is the person who is indicating what should happen next. So often the way we structure it is the person who is more familiar with the project at that moment or that aspect of the project is the navigator, not the driver. So that they, they know exactly what they need to do, but they need to pass all of it through the driver. So it vastly increases how much both people learn because the person who thinks they know it has to explain it again and in explaining has to clarify what they think they know. And the person who is a little fuzzy on concepts has to be paying very close attention as they understand the navigator's explanation and turn it into code. So it's a really strong educational tool, but it can also be really challenging for both people. Another thing you're probably going to do is code reviews. You're going to look at somebody else's program and critique it. That's a regular thing that needs to happen in good quality organizations. They're going to look at each other's code and see how they can make it better. See if you can find the bugs or the defects in their code. Uh, so for me, I spend some of my day coding. Um, I spend some of my day uh, designing features with other people. I, I, every day is slightly different in that sense, you know, depending on whether, where we are in our product cycle. Um, I'll spend some of my day reviewing part of my team's code um, that, that, that they want to check in. I spend some of my day um, just generally talking with, with coworkers about making sure that we're all in sync on the project we're building. We tend to build things very quickly, um, and we oftentimes have many pieces in motion at the same time all trying to, to come together uh, all at once and, and keeping that ship moving in the right direction can be can be challenging at times but it's also very rewarding when you can see you know app updates that go out every three weeks sometimes and, and you know have a brand new set of features I mean it doesn't get built overnight but you're starting to get pretty close to it <laughs> a day in the life um... Let's see, typically I get into the office around 9 o'clock, maybe 9.30, uh, and the day consists of a constant barrage of impossible things. Um, uh, the team, uh, at, the Android team at Tumblr is me and another guy. Uh, he and I just kind of divvy up the work. Uh, we have an active sprint list that we're trying to hit for the end of the week. Um, so on a Monday, we'll set out what we're going to do for the week, and then for the rest of the week, we're knocking it out. Um, there's some amount of meeting and discussion. I work with the designers to to figure out what the next feature is going to be, what those things are going to look like. Uh, the designers give me mock-ups in Photoshop and I do my damnedest to make them as pixel perfect as I possibly can. Um, so it's a, it's a constant day of, you know, some days I'm building features, uh, sometimes for, for a week on end I'm working on the same feature. Other times I'm changing tasks 20, 30 times a day just trying to fix bugs. So it, a lot of it depends on where in the project it is. Um, the best days though are days where I have no meetings and no distractions and I can just go to town on a huge chunk of code. Um, there's nothing blocking me. I don't need to wait for resources. I just have, you know, some far-flung, far-away goal to hit and, uh, and a lot of time to get there. Uh, for me, I work basically half and half, um, half with a bunch of external partners, so developers from other companies, bigger brands, marketers, develop, uh, designers, developers, all sorts of people who are building stuff on top of Facebook. Um, and part of my time is helping them sort of build great products. Another part of my time uh, I spend in Canada just 
um, basically coming up with a bunch of uh, guidance around platforms. So um, I did a talk today, I don't know if you caught that, around social design principles and patterns and stuff that we've learned from working across all these different industries and helping all sorts of different people build all sorts of different apps. Um, a lot of what I do is drawing sort of the winning tactics from um, those apps, what worked, what did not work, and then trying to figure out how to scale them to the rest of the world. So uh, what's, what's it like? It sounds like an awesome place to work. What's it like to be a developer at VaynerMedia or WineLibrary.com? That's a really good question. Um, I would say it's way better than the market that you're in is. Meaning, being a developer at a e-commerce site or being a developer at an agency is not necessarily as exciting as being a de developer at Square or Vine or or Facebook, right? In, in theory, those are places where a developer is not at the tippy top of the greatest thing that they could ever have. But because AJ and I and and uh, in Vayner and me at Wine Library are so obsessed with developer culture, you've got a CEO who respects your knowledge of Python, right? Who respects it, your knowledge of Rails. And to me, not that developers are first, because I'm a businessman, so businessmen are first, but my respect level, because Eric Kastner and John Casimatis, my two first developers at Wine Library, are people that I hold so near and dear into my heart. I went to both of their weddings. I love those guys with all my heart. I treat developers better than they should be treated within the context of the businesses because I just like them more than the normal person within my industry. For a non-startup, like true develop, not tech startup, we probably treat and respect developers higher than the norm. What is agile software development and why does it matter to aspiring developers? Agile software development is a family of methods that economizes the discipline of creating great software. Developers using agile methods will use iterative, incremental, and even test-driven methods to produce great software that's fast, reliable, and with the least amount of time or resources. We spoke to Mishkin Bertik, the president and CEO of Bertik Consulting, who is a former software architect himself, and now consults with companies to teach them the most recent agile methods. It's kind of this idea that some people might have heard of that, you know, if you've got a project that, that's late, if mm -hmm. you add people to it, you're only going to make it later. And the reason for that is because bringing someone up to speed and adding the communication overhead with them just adds complexity to the project. In 2001, a bunch of people who were exploring these ideas, which were called lightweight methods, got together and they decided to rename it. They, you know, a branding uh, lightning bolt hit and they called it Agile instead of Lightweight. And they created this thing called the Agile Manifesto, which you can check out at agilemanifesto.org. And it has these values and principles that have started taking over uh, the software world in IT departments, in uh, product development, in high tech. So you know, a lot of big companies that are very famous uh, use agile methods or are trying to use them because there are there are some challenges. It's not it's not just an easy switch over. So some names that of course people will recognize include, for example, Google. Um, I do also have contacts there, and I know that they use agile techniques both in terms of software development techniques at the technical level as well as at the team level and the process level. Um, lots and lots of mid-sized companies are adopting agile techniques. So these are companies that might be, you know, B2B companies. And there's a lot of uh, companies like financial industry or uh, Department of Defense or, you know, education, even government agencies are adopting agile methods in their IT departments. Um, and telecoms. So. For example, I do extensive work with Ericsson in China. I was just there last week in Shanghai and uh, training a whole bunch of people at Ericsson. Uh, companies like Intel, uh, everyone, everyone is using Agile. I had just uh, started a contract with Charles Schwab as a senior technical person and they asked me to build a critical piece of their infrastructure for their investment systems. And 
So this piece of infrastructure was enterprise quality. It needed to uh, handle literally billions of dollars of transactions a day. It was, it was really a big deal. And I had just learned about some of the agile engineering practices, in particular refactoring and test-driven development. And <clears throat> I decided, you know what, I'm going to try these out. I'm going to get the people that I'm working with to use these things and we're going to run a little mini Agile project. And I didn't ask anyone. I just decided, heck, I'm going to do this. So um, it was a six-month-long project, and I actually delivered it a little bit early, uh, maybe a month early or something like that. And there was a really interesting problem that happened. When I delivered it, it was handed off to their QA department. And the people in the QA department kind of started freaking out because they couldn't find any defects. It was the first time they had ever seen something like this, a real substantial piece of code with no defects to be found anywhere. So it worked properly, it worked to specification, it worked under you know, high loads, and all of this was because, in my mind, I had used test-driven development and refactoring really, really rigorously throughout the development process. Those, those are two key agile engineering practices. And um, there's, there's good books written about both of them that are translated into quite a few different languages. So the first one, Refactoring, is uh, the title of a book by a guy named Martin Fowler, who is also really, really well known for a lot of his writing about software architecture. And then there's another book called Test Driven Development by Example, written by a guy named Kent Beck, B-E-C-K. Uh, and he's, he's also well known in agile circles. And so these two books actually form a really good foundation for anyone wanting to learn about these agile practices. Anyway, so I had this success at Charles Schwab where QA couldn't find any defects in the code that we had delivered. And so after agonizing over it for quite a long time, they finally decided, okay, really, it's, it's actually working code. Okay, let's, let's pass it on to test it out in the pre-production environment, which is supposed to be a real-world testing environment. And so they put it into this pre-production environment, and again, no problems at all. Nothing wrong with it. Worked perfectly. And again, everyone was kind of freaked out because, you know, how do you know if it's working if you can't find any problems? That's, that's kind of what their thinking was. And, uh, but again, they, they just kind of accepted this miracle had happened, and they moved it along then into their production environment. And it, it ran in their production environment for years without any problems. So from that, basically, the whole IT department in Charles Schwab started to adopt agile practices. And this happened over the course of a few years. It wasn't instantaneously because it was a lot of people and they needed to learn techniques and so forth. But uh, that was kind of my start with... Uh, officially introducing these techniques into organizations. 2012, what are developers making? What's the range, bottom end to, to top end? I mean, you talked about reaching an exceptionally high end. Yeah, actually the range is incredibly broad. And so, for example, I know that um, <laughs> I've done some outsourcing work where I've hired people through Elance, and I'm sure that the rates are way less than what I would consider minimum wage, like one or two dollars an hour worked, which of course is hard to live on unless you're in um, some very, very inexpensive location. Um, and, you know, India and China don't count. They're not that inexpensive. <laughs> um, you know, I know that, um, for example, a lot of the people that I work with in China who are you know, long-term software developers uh, maybe have a few years at least under their belt. They're making salaries that are similar to what people are making here, which is anywhere from about forty thousand to sixty thousand a year. And those are reasonable salaries for someone who's got a couple years of experience. Um, but like I said, if you really, really stand out and you have the right kind of opportunities, 
um, you can get a lot more than that. And, and that's usually people who are working as contractors. Um, so they're charging daily rates or hourly rates that add up to, you know, pretty big money. So, you know, like when I said I was making about $200,000, that, that basically boils down to I was making $100 an hour working full-time. And, you know, that's, that's really good, although um, now I build a lot more than that even. But anyway. <laughs> you need to insure your job. Make yourself so valuable your employer can't let you go. Uh, other distinguishing features of a successful Ruby programmer. I think. I think what I'd, I'd, I think what I'd, I'd say about a successful Ruby programmer is fundamentally it comes down to what defines any successful program in any language, and that is, it's a it's a it's a bigger world view if you like. A lot of Ruby programmers, I think, I mean, in my experience, quite a lot of Ruby programmers have come from a Java background. And so Ruby is the first really majorly different language that they've encountered. And I think a, quite a number of people coming to Ruby become almost dazzled by the things they can do because Ruby opens up a world in which you can, for example, a, a running program can easily modify itself, can add behavior to itself. It can change the way that an existing program works at runtime, all sorts of incredibly powerful tools at, at their disposal. And I think probably what I would say is would be a very good um, background for a Ruby programmer is to have a broader range of experience with other languages. If you've only experience of Java or another language, such as C Sharp or, or C, and now you've come to Ruby, make sure that you don't limit yourself to those two languages. Go and look at Python. Go and look at Smalltalk. I mean, Smalltalk is the archetypal object-oriented language. And for anybody using a language like Ruby, I think it's a tremendously useful experience to have some experience with Smalltalk. That really, really clarifies how object orientation was intended to work. Um, also, a lot of programmers these days don't have experience of memory management. Now, Ruby is what's called a garbage-collected uh, language, as is C-sharp, as is Java, and many modern languages. Auto they automatically take care of disposing of memory when it's no longer in use, so people are not familiar with, um, with techniques that would have been f instantly familiar to programmers from 10 or 15 years ago. And that is, for example, how to allocate memory, how to get a chunk of memory whenever you need to create some new piece of data. And what do you do when that memory is no longer required, when your data has finished its use in the program, how to get rid of it. Now Ruby and garbage collected programs are doing this silently behind the scenes and most of the time that's a good thing. But when you want your program to work in specific ways, when you want it to be efficient, when you want to solve certain problems, an experience and an understanding of how memory allocation works is incredibly useful. And so, again, I would advise people who want to be good Ruby programmers to go and work with a language such as C or um, with a language such as Pascal or, to a certain extent, on, on the Mac with, with Objective-C, which also, um, to, to some extent, requires you to be, be familiar with memory allocation. And go and work with those languages and really understand memory allocation and how to use pointers. Again, that's uh, a way of pointing at, at particular memory addresses. In other words, try to get to understand what's called slightly lower level programming. There's a lot of modern languages, and Ruby is a classic example. Most of the time, hide a lot of the complexities of what's really happening in your programs. So, so to, for, for really good mastery, just go and do the, the hard work that programmers 15 years ago would have, would have had no option but to do. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Um, can we just briefly touch on the history of, of Ruby? When I think of Ruby, I think of Ruby on Rails. Is Ruby on Rails is from <coughs> 37 Signals, correct? Is that different from Ruby itself? Right. Ruby on Rails is completely different from Ruby. Ruby uh, has been around quite a lot longer than Ruby on Rails. I I think the first version of Ruby was, I think it was 1995 released. It was certainly in, in, in the 90s. And Rails came along later. Rails is something that can be used with Ruby. So you, when, 
you program Ruby, you don't have to use Rails. In fact, a lot of people never use Rails. A lot of Ruby programmers never touch Rails. So what Rails does is it provides tools and code uh, to enable Ruby to be used as a language uh, for online applications, mainly for online applications. So the applications that you can enter data in a web page, things like forums, things like um, blogs, that sort of traditional interactive web-based application. So what Rails does is it, it allows people to pr program the behavior of those applications so that when people go to a blog and they submit a, a blog post, behind the scenes, Ruby is the language that goes and processes that post. It goes and gets it and it might, it might do something with it, it might add tags to the post, etc. And then it, go, it communicates with the, the database via Rails. So Rails is, as I mentioned earlier, with um, the C-sharp language on Windows, it uses something called the .NET framework. The .NET framework is a, a set of tools and code that gives extra features to the C-sharp language. And, and Rails is, in a way, comparable. It's a, what's called a framework. And so it adds on extra features to allow people to use, use Ruby for programming web-based applications. Um, one of the disadvantages, well, it's not a disadvantage, but one of the one of the problems that some Ruby programmers have is I think they, they're so seduced by the idea of Ruby on Rails that they start by learning Rails rather than starting by learning Ruby. And I think that's a very, very bad idea because you can get a long way in Rails by running simple scripts. You can enter some simple commands and it goes away and it creates a uh, a very basic application that you can put on a website within really within minutes and but when you then come to tailor that application for your own requirements when you come to change it from being a very basic um, submit some data sort of application into a real working blog or a real working forum or a shopping site or whatever you're developing if you don't know Ruby you are going to be in really really serious trouble because Rails creates a, a or a simple ready-to-run application, but it doesn't replace the programming skill that you'll need to turn it into a really solid, real-world, workable application. So I always advise people, if they want to do Ruby on Rails applications, for the, at least the first few months, forget Rails completely. Learn Ruby. Once you've learned Ruby, then approach Rails. So I, th I think that's something that you know a lot of people get the wrong way around. That they want to start with a complete application, and they they see that they can do it by running a simple script in Rails, and then they hit the problems because they haven't got the skill that they need to to take that application from being a basic application into a real world application. Uh, two things for maintainable code are clarity and modularity. By clarity, I mean that your code should be readable by somebody else. You should be able to give your code to somebody else, and they should be able to make sense of it. Now, there's a lot of people are able to do clever coding that is not particularly clear. So it might do the job, and it might do it very effectively, and it might do it very efficiently. Um, and they might have thought of good ways of getting some particular task done, but they give the code to somebody else, or it becomes part of a project which... 12 months or two years or three years down the line, somebody else who's never even met the original programmer doesn't know perhaps even who wrote that code. Somebody else has given that code and they have to make it work. And it has to be clear. Uh, and the other thing, and it's a related uh, feature really, is modularity. Now by modularity, I mean that each piece of code that does a specific job should be in a clearly defined place. And it shouldn't have side effects upon code that's outside that clearly defined space. Um, now, this is, I, I'd say a little bit more about modularity because a lot of programmers these days are not really completely familiar with that concept. In object-oriented programming, and Ruby is an object-oriented language, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of encapsulation, and so that means that you put the data, the variables, and the behavior, that's the methods that act on the, the, the data, inside a class and you create objects from them. But they're not so familiar with the idea of modularity, by which I mean there should be one way in to that data and one way out. And that when somebody recodes, for example, the, beha the implementation of a method, that should not have any possibility of creating unexpected side effects 
on objects or on code outside the class in which it's defined. Uh, and a lot of people find that quite an unusual idea. I, I mean, I happened to come across this, really, I suppose, through a, a, a different uh, line of languages. It's the Pascal line of languages, and in particular, a language called Modular 2 that really, really emphasized uh, the importance of modularity. And so I was exposed to those ideas many years ago, quite early on in my programming experience. And I've taken that with me throughout every other language that I've come across, that idea of keeping everything absolutely clear and completely modular. And I think it's a shame, really, that a lot of people these days who are learning to program are unfamiliar with, with that idea so that, so that they encapsulate data and behavior, but they don't pay any close attention to what I call modularity. That is the ability to, to isolate the behavior from the programming world outside the module or outside the object uh, in which it occurs. It's almost like a code of ethics that I would encourage for uh, people who are trying to be agile developers. And by the way, just to be really clear, I think that most software developers are not professionals. They are not living up to a professional standard. And that with agile techniques, there is the possibility that software development could become a very respected professional profession. It's popular, but I know from working in lots of businesses that software developers are not respected as professionals by, for example, the business side of organizations. So I think this really has a big potential to help software developers become professionals. So there's a few things. One is um, that a good software development professional always, always, always maintains the best possible internal quality of a system. So what that means is that, you know, a system can be built taking lots of shortcuts or it can be built properly. It can be built using good design techniques, good coding techniques. And so to be a software professional, you, you never sacrifice the internal quality of a system, of a system either by overbuilding, you know, making things too complex, or by underbuilding, which is, you know, taking shortcuts maybe because of business pressure. And one of the ways I like to explain this concept is that, you know, if you go into surgery and, you know, you know that seconds count, you're conscious and you're rolled in to the operating room, you don't yell out to the surgeon to, don't wash your hands, just dig into me. You know, you, you know that the surgeon has to wash their hands, even if it takes a few extra seconds. Because, you know, if they don't wash their hands, you're going to get an infection and you could die. So the same kind of thing applies to software and internal quality of systems. You know, if a business person asks you to just jump and, and take a shortcut and make something that's low quality just to get something out the door, that's kind of like asking a surgeon to just cut into you without washing their hands. It's not professional. And so that internal quality and, and living up to that standard is one of those qualities. Another one is the idea of collaboration um, and, and really being willing to collaborate with your team members using the most rich communication methods possible, which hopefully is face-to-face, -face, but it includes collaboration in all aspects of the system development. So it's not just coding, it's also really working with people to understand the problem, really working with people to investigate alternative solutions, and making sure that you're building the right thing, you know, the, the quality. So that's the second thing. Can I interject here? So yeah, sure. we, we spoke with the author of the little book of Ruby called Hugh Collingborn. He has a course on, on Udemy. And we asked him a similar question. And I, th I think he said it a different way, but he had talked about the importance of keeping code clean and modular. Yeah. And he, exp he explained that as if, if, I, if I write some code in some Ruby script, um, that should be written and constructed in such a way that two years from now, Michigan Pratik could come in, add to that code, and it totally makes sense and can scale. Is that is that is that a good example of what you're talking about? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar. And actually, one of the hidden secrets of doing that is simplicity. In other words, you're not trying to find the most elegant or complex solution. You're trying to find the simplest solution. And this is something that, um, you know, a lot of young software development developers, they're worried if, if I make this too simple, it won't look impressive. But actually, simplicity is incredibly important for keeping uh, the level of quality in a system high. Myths. I take debunking myths very seriously here at How to Become Zuck. I am not a nerd! Okay, maybe a little too seriously. I just want to be the guy who finds the truth so you don't have to brave the wild west of coding uninformed. So we are going to line these myths up and knock them out. Yeah, definitely. Um, if I were going to go back, I would finish my computer science degree. I had actually switched to economics um, because I figured that offshoring would take programming jobs away. Uh, but now that I've been programming for so long, uh, it seems like the d demand with India is, yeah, is just not going to happen. The demand is insatiable for programmers, even in the U.S. As long as you're on the newest technologies, um, you, you won't have to worry about being offshored. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to outsource a, a job like uh, computer programming because of um, the demand for new software is insatiable such that even India can't compete with uh, that demand. So in my career, um, I haven't had a problem being offshored or outsourced. Um, it's been very rare that I've um, had to look for work because of that, because the demand uh, for new software, even mobile apps, is a good um, example of that because even India programmers are not even programming mobile apps yet. It's going to be 10 years before they even get on that technology and compete with American programmers for that. Actually, when I was first looking at Catalyst and emailing the founders, uh, I asked, like, do I need to study some more math before this program? <laughs> and uh, the response was very enlightening. It's uh, math-heavy code is a branch of programming. That is not all of programming. In fact, that is not most of programming. Um, that really, really math-heavy algorithms, all that stuff, there are people who are kings of that, and that's a discipline unto itself. Um, and there I are, didn't even know that. I didn't even yeah. know that. That's a great point. Thank you. <laughs> of course, there are huge swaths of programming where you don't really need anything beyond the math you learned in grade school. I guess there's still some sort of like thing around you have to be good at math in order to be good at programming. Um, that certainly becomes true when you start to build very complex things, but I think it's something that you can, it's a skill that you build and learn. You don't need to, you know, remember everything from grade 12 calculus in order to be a good programmer. Um, there's also a lot of stuff to, that, you know, that has to do with building for the web or creating that doesn't involve much math at all. Um, most of the stuff you'll do to build a website is pretty much math free, um, other than a few things. So I think we need to just sort of get rid of that whole idea that you need to be good at math in order to be a good programmer. And there's really not a lot of math involved in programming per se, depending on what field you're in. Uh, but what hooked me was just the problem solving and figuring out puzzles, small puzzles. Um, you're trying to figure out how to get the machine to do what you want it to do. And sometimes it's not so straightforward. So you have to think a lot and figure out um, the solution to the problem. So a lot of problem solving. Thank you for watching or listening to How to Become Zuck. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at jace at howtobecome.tv. That's J-A-Y-C-E at howtobecome.tv. If you are interested in book two and book three, you can sign up for a pre-release discount before anyone else at howtobecomezuck.com. Book two is called Rise of the Hacker Schools, all about how to become a developer without a degree. Book three is called Resumes Don't Work, all about job interview prep. Good luck.